In this lecture, we are going to explore the dynamic behavior in PFM and the excitation mode that can be used in the PSD response force microscopy. So let's start with the recap of the contributions to the PFM signal. So in general, when we apply between the tip and the surface, when the tip is in contact, we have the surface displacement, which has the vertical uh, component and two in-plane components. We have the local electrostatic forces that act between the tip and the surface. And we have the distributed electrostatic forces that act on the cantilever. All these contributions result in the uh, change in the cantilever uh, angle and detected as the AFM contrast. So we have these five contributions. And uh, in general, we have four observables. So we can measure vertical and lateral PFM signal when the cantilever is oriented in one orientation versus the surface. And when the cantilever is mechanically rotated by 90 degrees. So we have four PFM signals in vector PFM. And the general calibration becomes establishing the relationship between the surface displacement vector and the electrostatic forces and the cantilever parameter. So we know that the lateral PFM signal is actually easy to quantify. It's determined only by the uh, shear displacement of the surface. A vertical PFM contrast, however, is determined by four contributions. So we have the local PS effect, so just how the surface moves up and down and uh, forces the tip to move with it. Local electrostatic force, which in, results in the interaction forces between the tip and the surface, which kind of pushes the tip inside the material. There is a longitudinal signal, so the surface displacement along the cantilever axis moves the end of the tip, and this also is measured as the cantilever bending. And finally, we have the non-local electrostatic forces. So vertical PFM signal is the sum of these four contributions, which are dependent both on frequency and geometric properties of the cantilever. And they also depend on the contact stiffness between the tip and the surface. So to get some insight into the mechanism of the PFM, we can analyze the cantilever dynamics assuming the Euler-Bernoulli model, so just the beam equation. So our equivalent schematic is depicted here. So this is our cantilever, this is our tip. The properties of the tip surface junction is defined by two contact stiffnesses, K1 vertical, K2 uh, in plane. We have the local electrostatic force and we have the electromechanical surface displacement, D1 vertical and D2 in plane. The beam equation without damping can be written down like this. This is a fourth order differential equation. And the boundary conditions here are related to the second and third derivative of the uh, cantilever function. And they can be derived in the following shape. This equation is linear which means that it allows for the general solution of the following form, where the total cantilever bending angle is the sum of this four term corresponding to vertical displacement, longitudinal displacement, local electrostatic force, and the distributed force. And each of those contributions comes with a corresponding frequency dependent term. In addition, we have a term in the denominator, which is uh, determined, defines the resonance structure of the equation. So there are good things and the bad things about this equation. So first of all, our signal is linear. It is a superposition of the vertical longitudinal local and non-local terms, which basically means that these contributions can be studied separately. Secondly, the resonances are determined by the elastic properties of the material only, which basically means that we cannot use the resonance imaging to separate the vertical or longitudinal terms. They're going to be amplified to the same degree. However, the anti-resonances can be in principle used to nullify chosen response components. So if we know when this term or this term becomes zero, we can use this frequency in order to make the imaging free of those responses. 
However, practically, we don't necessarily know where they are. So this is something that is possible in theory, but maybe not uh, practically realizable. At least uh, it was not real. So the general solution for this Euler-Bernoulli equation is very well studied in the context of the atomic force acoustic microscopy. And uh, the resonances are dependent only on the elastic properties of the material. So resonance structure looks like this. So imagine that we plot the resonant frequencies as a function of the normalized elastic constant of the tip surface junction. So this is a, essentially a ratio of the cantilever stiffness to the uh, contact stiffness. If the contact stiffness is very weak, so the cantilever is essentially free, we have the first non-contact resonance. If we start to increase the contact resonance frequency, contact resonance stiffness, so we move the cantilever close to the surface and get in touch, our first free resonance becomes the first contact resonance. So similarly, the second free resonance, if we approach the surface, becomes the second contact resonance and so on. Notice that the inflection point, so it corresponds to halfway between free cantilever and the contact resonance, it shifts towards higher elastic stiffnesses for higher resonance number. So basically what it means is that uh, using the different resonances, the cantilever can behave as if it is strongly coupled to the surface or uncoupled to the surface. For example, here, the first contact resonance is correspond to the coupled cantilever, but the fourth resonance correspond to the almost free cantilever. So basically playing with the excitation frequency, we can control how sensitive is the cantilever with respect to the surface. Uh, secondly, we know that there are gaps that separate the uh, resonances. So here we have the transition region between contact and non-contact resonance. Here we have the second resonance. There is a gap that separates these two responses. We also know that depending on the parameters of the cantilever, we can get the rough estimate for the vertical and the sliding behavior, and we can analyze the frequency behaviors. For example, the longitudinal signal is expected to behave as one over frequency power one half. Vertical and local electrostatic signal are expected to behave as one over frequency, and the non-local signal is expected to behave as one over frequency power three halves. So all components decay with the frequency, non-local signal will decay fastest. In principle, longitudinal should be slowest. However, there is an onset of the sliding friction, so it's not clear how significant it would be at the high frequency. So uh, this is a kind of recap of the uh, same slide. So it shows clearly the frequency dependence and uh, the frequency gaps and uh, of course we need to take into account that for the non-planar tip the spring constant are bias dependent as well now we can analyze this behavior quantitatively uh, in the response versus frequency diagrams so what is shown on this slide is the pfm signal for the soft cantilever 0.1 newton per meter and medium cantilever to a 0.4 newton per meter. When we calculate the PFM signal and plot the relative contribution of the electrostatic and electromechanical signal versus frequency. So as you can see here, the uh, for small tip biases, the signal is predominantly electromechanical. So the white regions mean that the electromechanical signal dominates. The black regions mean that the electrostatic signal dominates. As can be expected, the electrostatic signal dominates for high tip surface potential differences and it dominates for low frequencies. So the higher the frequency, the less important is the electrostatic signal. However, this dependence is pretty complicated and it strongly depends on the resonances and anti-resonances. So we cannot say that just imaging and the high frequency is enough to minimize electrostatic contribution. In fact, we have to be within one of those white regions 
So we need to know where we are with respect to the resonances and anti resonances. This is a slightly more uh, complex depiction of the same behavior when we analyze the dependence of the local electrostatic, non local electrostatic, and the electromechanical signal at the function of frequency and bias for soft, medium uh, cantilever and soft and shielded cantilever and very stiff cantilever. And you can see that in all cases we have roughly the same behavior. So the green contribution, the non-local electrostatic, is important only for low frequencies and high biases. And the uh, uh, electromechanical contribution is important for low tip surface potential differences and for high tip surface potential differences we are now limited by the non-local electrostatic interactions. Notably the boundary between the non-local electrostatic interactions and the electromechanical interactions is determined only by the tip bias and is independent on frequency. So this is something that we need to take into account when analyzing the data. So this is the illustration of how this electrostatic effects are looking in the experimental data. So this is the set of three images of the PZT ceramics when our tip bias is minus 10 volts, 0 volts and 10 volts. And uh, as you can see, we see the signal being dominated by the uh, electrostatic signal and negative here by the electrostatic signal and positive here and only at the zero volt the signal is uh, represents the true bias polarity and in fact we can even see how the domains change their relative magnitude uh, depending on the electrostatic contribution what's interesting is that if we measure the amplitude dependence on bias for this type of electrostatic interactions we are going to see this very characteristic v-shape so this is how the amplitude uh, depend on the bias for the electrostatically controlled signal. If there is piezoelectric switching, we start to additionally see the hysteresis related to the electromechanical response and that switching. So to summarize, in the low frequency regime, we can write the PFM signal as the contribution of several components. So they scale differently with the uh, spring constant of the tip surface junction and the cantilever with the capacitance of the cantilever and the tip and the tip surface potential difference and uh, this electromechanical contribution looks like this so notice that uh, the stiffer is the tip surface contact the more quantitative is the measurement so typically this is around 1000 cantilever can be anywhere between 0.1 and 10 so generally we're operating in the regime when the k1 is pretty large the local electrostatic contribution depends on sum of k1 plus k and the non-local electrostatic contribution depends on the spring constant on the cantilever only. So that gives us the estimate in which conditions we should uh, be measuring to get the quantitative data. So this is the experimental study of the frequency and bias dependence of the cantilever responses. So this is the example of the measurements on the silicon oxide when we're in contact with the surface and non-contact. So here you see the first contact resonance and the second contact resonance. This value corresponds to the uh, zero of electrostatic signal. So here the T potential and the surface potential are equal. And you can see that the zero doesn't depend on the frequencies can be expected. This is the non-contact measurements. So in this case you see the first non-contact resonance, second non-contact resonance, third non-contact resonance. And uh, again, the zero of the potential, the nulling bias, does not depend on the uh, frequency. So this is the same analysis for the lead zirconite titanate. So in this case, you can see that the resonance structure is roughly the same. You can see a set of the contact resonances. However, the nulling potential has clear dispersion with the frequency. And this happens because the electromechanical and electrostatic contributions have different frequency dependence. 
And uh, the interesting uh, corollary of this studies is that uh, the electrostatic and electromechanical signals are actually very difficult to separate because the electromechanical measurements are going to measure the linear combination of the two and only if we know electrostatic potential of the surface independently we can separate the electrostatic and electromechanical signal. In comparison, this is the similar picture for the bad tipple and the mechanical coating on the tip is damaged. So in this case, we can see that the nulling potential is almost independent on the bias, which basically means that our tip is damaged and therefore what we measure is purely electrostatic signal and not electromechanical signal anymore. Can we separate those signals? So in principle, what we can do is to uh, measure the signal dependence on bias for each frequency fitted by the uh, linear function. And then the slope of this function gives us the measure of the electrostatic signal. So this is how it looks like for lead zircon titanate and silicon oxide, either in contact or non-contact. In comparison, the PFM signal is supposed to be the offset of this function and we need to postulate that we know that electrostatic contribution and this is how it depends for these three materials so electromechanical contribution can be determined only if surface potential is known and this is something that we are going to explore further in the technique of contact kpf so the references where these topics are discussed in more detail are these three papers, the dynamic effects and electromechanical SPM, quantification of SPM, and quantification of the in-contact uh, local contribution in uh, PFM. So uh, it is possible to extend this quantification scheme to find the D33 quantitatively. However, to do that, it is necessary to explore the cantilever shape in more detail. And this uh, quantification in turn would be dependent on laser position, frequency, the shape of the beam and the sensitivity of the photodetector. So a significant step forward in this direction was achieved by Labud and Proksh about four years ago, who basically combined the classical uh, beam deflection AFM with the interferometer, which provided the independent measure of the piezoelectric constant. So notice that this diagram shows the distribution of piezoelectric properties of certain material measure the classical beam deflection, where we see the very significant variation depending on whether the tip is on or by or whether the laser is on the end of the tip or above the tip or slightly short of the tip. So it's not really quantitative. However, if we have the foot, if we have the interferometer, the measurements become highly uh, repetitive and uh, uh, quantitative. However, this approach requires the additional hardware, so you need this interferometer. The alternative approach for quantification of PFM can be based on the detailed analysis of the beam shape. So we know that the uh, beam shape strongly depends on the conditions, uh, boundary conditions, so we can introduce the same analysis and uh, quantify the displacement profile across the cantilever. And uh, we know that the uh, shape of the cantilever is strongly determined by the resonant contact stiffness. So it changes rather significantly depending on whether the cantilever uh, is soft or hard relative to the tip surface. So in principle, it is possible to develop the approach for quantification of PFM when we determine the tip geometry and detector sensitivity. So we need to know what we measure, calculate the contact stiffness, determine the slope at the location of the laser spot and corresponding shape factor, and correct the data by the shape factor to make it independent on the cantilever. It turns out that this shape factor is actually quite complicated that it can also change sign. So basically, depending on the cantilever st stiffness, our signal can be inverted relative to the true value of the piezoelectric constant. And this is the example where we look at the material such as uh, 
periodically fold lithium nitrate. So we know that this should be almost ideal material. We are measuring it in the glove box. However, our distribution of the piezoelectric constants is strongly asymmetric. So you can see that for the one domain, the response is on the level of 0.5, and for that, it's 1.5. So the question is why? It turns out that uh, the electrostatic contribution can be a part of it. So we know that the electrostatic potential over one domain and another domain can be different. So the question is, can we somehow quantify the electrostatic contribution and the electromechanical contribution for the different domains? And it turns out that uh, it is possible to do that. We can do it through the quasi-PFM loops when we measure the signal as the function of the tip bias and we get this type of curves for different cantilevers. So you can see that the slopes are rather different, which is the measure of the electrostatic interactions, and the offsets are also different. So simply because the different cantilevers have different shape factors. However, once we quantify the surface potentials through the Kelvin probe microscopy independently, we can combine these two informations in order to calculate the piezoelectric constant of the material independently. And with this correction, we get a very well-defined values for the quantitative piezoelectromechanical response, which is now independent on the cantilever. So we quantify the measurements to produce the quantitative results of the uh, electromechanical response of the material, and also the quantitative results on the tip surface pattern. Turns out that these electrostatic forces are actually strongly dependent on the material. So the interesting thing is that for contact electrostatic problem, when our tip touches the surface, the electrostatic force should be diverged. Practically, of course, there is no divergence because there is a finite physical separation between the uh, tip and the surface, so the level of the unit cell. And if we calculate the electrostatic force as a function of the dielectric constant for different tip surface separation, it goes like this. So first it increases and then it saturates. It turns out that if we measure it experimentally, sort of we measure the interaction force for multiple materials with a different dielectric constant, we have the following behavior. So the electrostatic force increases until the uh, about 2030 dielectric constant, and then it stabilizes. So this is a physical limit when the tip and the surface uh, separated by the atomic uh, level, contamination level. We also can explore this behavior as a function of the set point and the cantilever stiffness and generally obtain the cohesive picture of the tip. Another important aspect of this electrostatic force is that they are strongly influenced by the sample topography, just the result of the capacity of interactions and uh, the concave or convex surface will give rise to the electrostatic contrast. So for example, for the hafnium oxide film, the electrostatic forces are directly determined by the local slope and the electrostatic interactions would be higher in the crevices on the region and would be much lower on the protrusion. So the next step is, uh, can we use the resonant enhancement in the PFM? So as many of you know, the resonant enhancement is one of the primary tricks in the scanning probe microscopy designed to increase the signal strength. So the question is, can we do it in the PFM? The question is, do we have to? So what is shown on this map is the uh, roadmap for the PFM when we plot the electromechanical response and length scale. So within this blue region, we have uh, the uh, length scales and the response magnitude for muscle cells, non-electroactive materials, ferroelectric relaxers. And this is the region that can be accessed by the standard non-indentation. In the red region, including ferroelectric or piezoelectric, this is the sensitivity and resolution for the scanning probe microscopy. And uh, finally, outside of this region, we have a lot of interesting physics. For example, electroactive molecules, polar macromolecules, surface electronic flex electricity, secondary multiferroics. So there are a lot of physical phenomena that are not necessarily accessible to the classical SPF. 
The question is how can we get there? There are several strategies. So one is the use the resonant enhancement, which allows us to increase the signal by significant factor. Use of low temperature or ultra high vacuum platforms, so we reduce the system noise. Liquid environment, small cantilevers or low noise laser sources. So the question is, can we start with the resonant? So how would it work? So this is the typical behavior of the noise in the SPM signal. So noise goes like this blue line. So for high frequency, the noise in thermal. For low frequency, the noise is over 1 over F noise. And the red line shows the transfer function of the cantilever. So at the uh, resonance, the signal would be boosted by the factor of Q, the quality factor, uh, compared to the uh, thermal noise. So uh, the use of the dynamic modes in SPM allows us to actually increase the sensitivity by boosting signal to noise ratio. Can we do it in real time? And the answer is not really. So shown, what's shown in this slide is the schematic of the tip on the protrusion, depression, and the flat region on the surface. Imagine that our cantilever uh, is at the resonance for the position two, so when the tip uh, is on the flat surface. If we move the tip from position two to position three, the contact resonance stiffness is actually going to increase because the contact area here is larger. If that happens, that even though the material has exactly the same electromechanical response, the resonant frequency of the tip surface contact is going to be different. And as the result, the measured signal by the microscope is also going to be different. So since the resonant frequency depends on the topography and not on the electromechanical response, we need to be able to track the resonant frequency before we can compare the data. The second problem, however, is that standard phase lock loop frequency tracking electronics would be not stable in this case because the resonant frequency uh, is determined there by the phase offset and then the PFM, the phase offset is the measure of polarization orientation. The more general way to look at it is through the basic physics of the measurement signal system. So in the more simple description, the behavior of the cantilever in PFM is determined by three independent parameters. The force resonant frequency, which is related to the force gradient to contact stiffness, amplitude of the resonance, which is force, and Q factor, which is dissipation. However, single frequency scanning probe microscopy determines only two parameters out of three. So the system is un We can look at it at the uh, Fourier domain. So this is the example of the classical single frequency PFM when we excite the system by the sinusoidal domain and we detect the response uh, in time domain also the sinusoidal signal. So we use the lock in order to convert the sine wave to the amplitude phase of the driving frequency. Which basically means that in the Fourier domain we excite by the single frequency of the delta function and we do the detection at the same frequency or in the very narrow delta function. So can we improve the PFM? The answer is yes, we can. And we can do it through the use of so-called band excitation. So the idea here is very simple. Rather than being constrained by a single delta function, we are going to create a signal which has a finite width in the band of frequencies. So we create the signal in the Fourier domain. We send the signal to the uh, converter that creates the time-dependent signal, so now it looks like this. We send this uh, complex chirp signal to the tip at the excitation. We detect the response in the time domain. We convert it from the time domain in the frequency domain, and now we get the response in the same frequency band as the excitation. So this is the example of how this band excitation technique works. So we put the tip in one location and measure the uh, amplitude and phase as the function of frequency for one position. Then scanning it across the surface and plot the response. So this is the example of the amplitude 
and face along the single line when we move the tip across the um, grain boundary in the PZT. So what you see here is that the resonance frequency changes across the material. So we start here, then the resonance frequency goes down, then the resonance frequency goes up, then it changes again. So if we were measuring signal at one frequency only, our signal variation would be completely unrelated with our PFM signal. However, if we have the full picture of the signal as a function of frequency and position, we can separate the topographic effects, meaning the variation of the resonant frequency, and the strength of the PFM signal, meaning the magnitude of this contrast. And uh, this is how it works. So this is the example of this band excitation PFM. When we do these measurements on the PZT material, and we have a map of the response magnitude, resonant frequency, Q factor, and convergence. So convergence basically tells us whether our fit was successful. So there is a lot of tricks to configuring the PFM and the band excitation mode. So for example, if we choose our signal in this form, so this is our desired amplitude and this is our phase, the signal becomes like a single um, sync function. At the same time, if we allow our phase to change, we can have a more chirp-like signal where the energy distribution along the signal is more uniform. In fact, we can understand this behavior based on how the sinusoidal components with the different phase offsets add. So in this case, they add to produce a strong amplification in only one time region. And here we uniformly spread energy across the uh, time of the signal. So there are positives and negatives to different way to configure it and practically we always try to work closer to this chirp regime. Now let's illustrate how this band excitation allows us to get inside into the topographic crosstalk in PFM. So this is the example of the uh, PFM signal on the very high quality epitaxial PZT film and what you can see here is the positive domain, negative domain, and the domain wall. So this is our amplitude signal. This is our phase signal. So here phase is positive, here phase is negative. And here we see our uh, resonant frequency signal. And here's, here is the Q factor. So notice that uh, the Q factor is almost uniform. So the dissipative properties of the material don't change that much. However, even for the high quality film, there is a significant shift in the resonant frequency on the surface. So it actually changes by about uh, three kilohertz. This is significant because the resonant itself is relatively narrow, which basically means that even small changes in the resonant frequency can result in the strong change in the signal. And you can see this effect on uh, this image where we simulate or rather get the cross-section of the PFM image as different frequencies. So if this is the uh, amplitude and this is phase images for different uh, frequencies in the vicinity of the resonance. So you can see that depending on where we are with respect to the average resonance frequency, we start to see a lot of spurious features due to this topographic crosstalk. So we see this protrusions, they are not real, it's just the variation of the resonant frequency. And uh, we start to, under some condition, we even start to see the changes in the uh, phase signal, which produces the spurious domain contrast. So remarkably is that this anomalous and phase behavior due to the indirect topographic crosstalk is very visible even for the uh, high quality surface. For surfaces which are less ideal, the variation of resonant frequency and crosstalk can be much, much larger. Now, what about the more complex modes of PFM? For example, the PFM switching. So uh, the principle of these measurements is illustrated in this slide. So imagine that we fix our tip on a single point on the surface, and we apply the waveform that looks like this. At the same time, on top of this switching waveform, 
we superimpose a small AC bias voltage which measures the PFM signal. So if we are here, so there is a zero bias on the tip, the material under the tip has a single polarity. If we apply the bias, we can create a small domain below the tip, and in this case, the response from this domain and the surrounding matrix start to uh, counteract each other, so our signal changes. If we increase bias, the domain starts to grow, and at some point, the electromechanical response of the region under the tip and the region uh, remaining matrix uh, uh, counteract each other and the total response is zero. So we basically measure the coercive bias. If we keep increasing bias, the domain grows larger than the signal generation volume under the tip, and we basically start to saturate the response corresponding to the opposite orientation. Then if we go in the opposite direction, what happens in most cases is that the domain doesn't shrink, so we stay on this remnant curve, but at some opposite bias, we start to nucleate the domain of the opposite dom polarity, almost like a Russian doll. And then if we keep doing it, at some point, our uh, material returns to the initial state. So basically what happens in this case is that we have a local bias-induced phase transition. For high-quality ferroelectric, it would be reversible. And uh, the measurement of this hysteresis loop gives us insight into the polarization dynamic below the tip. Turns out that uh, this measurement can also be combined with the band excitation. So in this case, this is our uh, switching waveform. This is our measurement waveform. If we do the measurements, then it tells us the evolution of the cantilever resonance during switching. So we start to be able to detect the switching events and we start to uh, detect how the resonant frequency and amplitude of the resonance change as a function of the bias. So this measurement become a pretty data intensive, so the typical data array size can be several gigabytes. And this is the reason to develop complex tool for the data analytics and PFM, so something that we will talk about. So this is a few examples of this band excitation polarization switching spectroscopy for materials such as PZT, where we look at the evolution of the uh, resonant frequency and the response. So the amplitude hysteresis loops is almost ideal, but at the same time, for whatever reason, polarization switching is associated with the change of the resonant frequency and the Q factor. So it tells us additional information about the evolution of the mechanical properties of the system during polarization switching. So these are the references that talk about the band excitation uh, and application of the band excitation in PFM. And uh, these few papers discuss the crosstalk in PFM. So uh, as mentioned, the changes of the mechanical properties of the tip surface junction can tell us something about the nature of the phase transition below the tip, for example, whether this is a 180 degree or uh, 90 degree switching, or whether there is a tip induced electrochemical reaction. And some of these uh, studies are summarized in this. Finally, let's talk a little bit about the G model PFM. So, as mentioned above, the cantilever dynamic provides us a rich spectrum of information of tip surface interactions. So question is, can we actually collect this full information? So what we measure by classical lock-in detection or by the even by the band excitation is actually a small fraction of the full data contained in the tip surface. The other way to represent this loss of information is by the picture made by Stephen Jesse that compares what happens under the tip to what we actually measure on our detection system. So we get only a small fraction of the information con uh, contained in the material. So the way to get this full information is through what we call the general full information acquisition mode SPM, where rather than measure only the response at one frequency, we measure the full information flow from the photodetector. So we excite our cantilever, we can excite it using sine wave, or we can excite using band excitation or 
any other detection mode, for example, stress spectrum modulation. We detect the full response of the detector and we save it on the temporary storage and then we can analyze it in our in detail. So we basically save all our data at the rate of 4 megahertz during the entire 20 so once the data is saved we can process it any way we want so simple ways to excite the system by the sinusoidal wave and uh, then we can for example imitate the classical lock and measurements we can just calculate the amplitude and phase at the given frequency however we can also uh, find out what would be the response at the second and third resonant frequency at which we actually didn't excite the sample. We can implement the information theory based analysis. For example, we can take our signal, convert it in the Fourier domain, and use the techniques such as principal component analysis to decouple it in the loading maps and corresponding eigenvectors. And what turns out is that our loading map gives us the information about the electromechanical response for first several eigenvectors and then the third and fourth eigenvectors start to give us transients associated with the topographic behavior and the reason why these are separated is because they are statistically independent and the uh, principal component analysis is extremely good method for separating the signal and the statistically independent component we can use this approach, which we called in this case GVS, for the hysteresis loop measurements. So uh, I've shown you the example of the uh, band excitation spectroscopy, in which case we have a switching wave and the measurement wave. So this approach gives us this classical PFM loops, but it's very time consuming. It takes us something like hour and a half for a relatively modest image. Turns out that with this GVS approach, we can just apply a sinusoidal wave and use these big data techniques in order to recover the strange hysteresis loops. In this case, we can measure something like 10,000 hysteresis loops per second, which basically means that we can create a, on the same region the image which will contain standard 256 by 256 pixels in just 17 minutes. So we measure slightly different signal, strain rather than piezo response, but we measure it 10,000 times faster. And uh, in fact, we can, uh, in this case, each pixel contains. Of course, there is a lot of uh, nuances about how these measurements are done. So for example, we need to implement the approach for the proper data-driven filtering. So we uh, throw away the noise and uh, we preserve the useful signal and we don't create the artificial signals. But once it's done, it's done and it works remarkably well. And, uh, simple comparison of the band excitation spectroscopy and the GVS illustrate that it really works much faster. The practical limitation, of course, is that we are measuring slightly different parameter, strain rather than the PS response. And secondly, experimentally, we found that for many materials, the surface stability becomes a limiting factor. So in uh, GVS, on the capacitor system, it works, but many practical materials just start to burn out. So the question is, would it be more stable in a vacuum compared to the ambient environment? And the answer for this question is still open. However, once we have this data set, we can analyze it the same way as we did in the uh, piezo response spectroscopy. We can analyze the characteristic shape of the hysteresis loops and plot them as maps. And we can also use the principal component analysis to separate the relevant components of the electromechanical response. So this gives us some insight into the uh, special distribution of polarizations. So in this case, rather than collecting only a fraction of the information contained in the material, where it can contain all information, the only thing we need to do is to learn how to interpret. Again, uh, these are the reference for this dynamic mode. So the uh, G mode, SPM is introduced in this several publications. So this is done in barely in the last five years. And the application for variety of SPM techniques is summarized in What's interesting is that if we combine the developments of the different modalities of uh, PFM and represent them in the form of the more lower 
so the dependence of the data size versus year, you can see that from 2005, 2006, when the band excitation and the switching spectroscopy PFM were introduced till a few years ago, the data volumes have grown up to 100 gigabyte range. And the reason why this happened is because we went from single frequency excitation when our signal is compressed from about 10 megahertz to 1 kilohertz, so it's 10,000 time compression. Band excitation allows us to uh, be much more careful about how much data we collect. So our compression is to about 100 kilohertz. Gym audio is a full streaming to about uh, at about 10 megahertz. So now we are limited not by how much data we get from the microscope, but what we can do with this data. So the storage analysis issues and one of the developments in which we are moving now is the full sharing of the codes for analysis of this type of data, which is available at the Picroscopy domain of the GitHub. And all of you are welcome.